the group. So um, I decided just to give a little bit of a talk on rotator cuff disease and, and the spectrum of disease all the way from impingement through to cuff tear arthropathy. Um, so as we all know, cuff dysfunction is a disease of continuum. Um, so you start at the more at the earlier end of the spectrum and the more mild um, presentation of disease with uh, subacromial impingement um, going through to bursitis, tendinopathy, partial thickness tears, full thickness tears, and unfortunately in a certain proportion of people onto cuff tear arthropathy. Um, there's a number of theories as to the evolution um, of cuff dysfunction. Um, initially, near was a big proponent of the uh, extrinsic theory being um, more uh, subacromular impingement type theory. Um, others sort of disagreed with this a bit and thought it was more of an intrinsic problem within the tendon that, that, that kicked off um, the cascade um, of rotator cuff tendinopathy. And there's obviously a traumatic etiology in a few people where they have an acute traumatic rotator cuff tear. Um, so the extrinsic theory essentially revolves around external comp compression or repetitive micro trauma of the rotator cuff from the anterior acromion. This was based on most, mostly on Nier's work in 1972. He looked at 100 cadaveric shoulders um, and found spurs and excrescences on the underside of the acromion um, and basically deduced that this was the main etiology in rotator cuff um, pathology. And this, these findings essentially led to near developing um, what we essentially do now, which is the anterior acromioplasty for the treatment of subacromial impingement syndrome. Near went on to classify um, rotator cuff dysfunction as number one, which is acute bursitis with edema and hemorrhage. He also further talked about an age group being essentially less than 25. Um, Type 2 was tendinopathy with a partial thickness tear, and the age group that he, he tacked onto that was between 25 and 40, um, and full thickness tears or class 3 in, a, in an older than 40 uh, population. Um, Big, Bigliani then contributed some work to the extrinsic um, theory in 86 when he um, classified the acromial morphology. I'm sure most of us are familiar with this. He essentially drew a line along the undersurface of the acromion based on supraspinatus outlet view x-rays um, and devised flat versus curved versus hooked and found that with the type 3 or hook there was a significantly increased um, incidence of impingement of rotator cuff pathology. Um, along different lines there were a group of um, surgeons who felt that it was primarily an intrinsic problem with the tendon rather than an extrinsic problem with compression and their theory was that this intrinsic tendinopathy weakened the supraspinatus, allowed humeral head migration and subsequently they did have a component of external impingement but the primary problem was um, an intrinsic problem with the tendon. Uh, Utoff was a big proponent of this and he basically cited the factors of hypovascularity, ageing and eccentric tendon overload as being the primary um, exciting events um, which caused this tendinopathy. Um, he based this on the fact that he's a, he observed a significantly increased incidence and severity of rotator cuff tears with increasing age, but that, that acromial degeneration wasn't as associated with increasing age. So if you looked at a group of patients who were, say, 70, he found the vast majority of them had tendon, tendinopathy but not all of them had problems or, or, or acromial degeneration. He also based this on the fact that the majority of partial thickness tears are articular sided um, and that an extrinsic theory didn't fit in with this because compression should predominantly cause bursal thighted sided tears. Um, the reality, uh, he also um, looked at a number of um, cadaveric studies and defined a critical zone of hypovascularity which is essentially on the articular side from the musculotendinous junction to within about five millimetres of the insertion of the uh, gratitude rosity. This was further supported by Benson, who did uh, histological studies and found evidence of hypoxia and apoptosis in the tenocytes of the rotator cuff. Um, and the reality is, and I'm sure we all would probably agree with this, that um, both theories play a role in the evolution of rotator cuff dysfunction and it's a multifactorial disorder with contributions from both etiologies. 
Um, so impingement without a tear, this is generally seen in a younger to middle-aged population group. Uh, their presentation is predominantly one of pain. They do have difficulty with overhead activities, but it's predominantly related to their pain and pain inhibition. Their strength should be well preserved, but they may have some pseudo weakness because of pain inhibition about the rotator cuff or deltoid. Um, and it can be primary, related to a, a, a primary subacromial um, etiology, i.e. a type 3 acromion, osteophytes or exostosis on the undersurface of the acromion, or essentially a narrow subacromial or coracoacromial arch. Um, it can also be a secondary or non-outlet impingement. Um, this is more seen in a younger age group, often in athletes, throwing athletes who can get subtle glenohumeral instability or an internal impingement phenomenon. So it's seen a lot in the States with baseballers. They get um, attenuation of their anterior structures, they get posterior capsular contractures and the so-called internal rotation deficit. Um, this predisposes them to getting impingement of the rotator cuff over the posterosuperior labrum. And these patients often have posterosuperior labral tears in addition to symptoms and uh, examination findings. Clinical findings, these patients may have a painful arc. They often have a limit in the, their abduction or forward elevation. However, their rotator cuff strength should essentially be preserved. They have positive impingement signs, so the signs of, uh, of Neer and Hawkins. Um, and in internal impingement, they'll have an increase in their external rotation, usually in the order of 10 to 15 degrees. A decrease, a corresponding decrease in their internal rotation. They often have uh, signs of anterior instability. Um, and they can be posterior and impingement positive. Um, investigations for these patients. So as usual, we'd start with plain x-rays, looking at the acromial morphology, whether they've got any degenerative change in their AC joint and any spurs contributing to um, subacromial impingement. It's always good to have a look at the glenohumeral joint and make sure there's not primary glenohumeral pathology which is um, being misdiagnosed or, or, or um, thought of as ro primary rotator cuff dysfunction. Um, and reasonable to do an ultrasound just to confirm they don't have a rotator cuff tear. Um, however, the most common thing to see on ultrasound is just subacromial bursitis. Um, depending on the patient population, an MRI is sometimes a reasonable investigation, especially in a younger age group with the internal impingement type pathology, just to ensure they don't have any other internal derangement and to assess their anterior capsular labral ligament structures um, for integrity. Um, the vast majority of these are managed um, non-operatively, education, lifestyle modifications, anti-inflammatories and analgesia. Um, injections have a 79% um, improvement rate with patients not requiring surgery at two years. Um, and physio tends to improve pain and function but doesn't really improve rate, um, range of motion or strength based on the studies that I read. Um, surgical management, um, acromioplasty can be used in patients who are non-responsive to non-medical management. And essentially that involves um, acromioplasty on its own. Um, open versus acromioplasty essentially have uh, equal outcomes and no difference in function, um, pain, etc. Um, but arthroscopic results in a, um, in a shorter hospital stay and could quickly return to Partial thickness tears, uh, and these are extraordinarily common and they're an age-related phenomenon. 30% um, of patients who are completely asymptomatic but greater than 60 years old will have a partial tear on MRI if you do MRI scanning. This increases to between 50 and 80% depending on which paper you read once you would get over 70 degrees. So these are 70-year-old people who are completely normal and well-functioning who go and have an MRI scan uh, but are completely asymptomatic and they will have either a partial, 50 to 80% will have either a partial or full thickness tear. Um, essentially they can be classified as articular, interstitial or bursal sided. And these have slightly differing pathogenesis and a slightly different um, natural history depending on, um, on, on where the partial thickness tear is located. Um, essentially, they have a very limited healing potential and the general rule with partial thickness tears is progression over time, but there is a small, there was a study that, that looked at, a, at um, partial thickness tears and about 
showed no progression and about 10% actually resolved when they were, that, that was done on arthrography. So there are limitations to arthrography, but they, they looked at arthrography two years later, followed these patients who were managed conservatively. 10% stayed the same, 10% uh, got worse, and about 60 to 65%, the 10% got better, 60 to 65% got worse. Um, articular sided tears are by far the most common. Um, in a series uh, by Weaver, in I think it was published in arthroscopy in 1999, 88% um, of the, of the um, partial thickness tears in his cohort were articular sided. Um, this is mainly to do with the fact that the critical zone of hypovascularity predominates on the articular side, and that the articular side has a much lower tensile strength and a lower ability to undergo deformation compared with the dorsal side. Um, essentially, the, this phenomenon is related to this intrinsic tendinopathy, so hypovascularity, age-related degeneration, etc. Um, but you also see the articular sided tears in the internal impingement phenomenon that we mentioned earlier. Um, the relevance of this is they have a, map, a, a more rapid progression and are less likely to resolve spontaneously or respond to conservative management compared to a bursal sided tear. Bursal sided tears are less common. Um, the bursal side has a higher tensile strength and have a better ability to undergo deformation. Um, there's a greater association with these types of tears and the external or subacromial impingement phenomenon. Um, Ozaki et al. did a cadaveric study and found that all cadaveric bursal tears had lesions of the acromion, so had some sort of inciting lesion causing impingement, whereas those that had um, Particular sided tears all had a normal acromial morphology without degeneration, without spur formation or exostosis. Bursal sided tears also show a slower progression so that it's more reasonable to treat them expectantly um, and operate on them at a later stage. Presentation, again, the presentation is going to be quite similar to that of impingement where you get the inflammatory edematous um, subacromial bursitis, um, and that's giving you the pain. Um, pain is usually the prominent uh, presenting feature in these patients. They often have a significant nocturnal component and complain of difficulty sleeping on the side. They often have pain coming down the anterolateral part of the arm and into the deltoid towards the deltoid insertion. Um, they may have mild rotator cuff weakness, but again, pain is the main feature. Um, and with these patients, because of this pain and its uh, potential radiating quality, like with any other pathology of the shoulder, you need to consider cervical spine pathology and the coping. Again, go through the same routine investigations, x-rays. Um, ultrasounds, I think, are the mainstay of diagnosing problems in the rotator cuff. They're cheap, they're readily, readily available. They're a dynamic investigation where you can observe impingement, bunching of the subacromial bursa and the like. The accuracy is very good, 93 to 94% sensitivity and specificity in a number of studies have um, reproduced these results. The biggest problem with ultrasound is it's operator dependent and it's very dependent on your sonographer and your radiologist to do the reporting the investigation. Um, MRIs are good to look for associated pathology and in partial thickness tears they're less relevant but we'll talk about their relevance in full thickness tears. Um, and I'm sure we're all aware that the gold standard is arthroscopy which is both diagnostic, diagnostic and therapeutic. However, it's a much more invasive modality than the others. This, these are arthroscopic slides here. The one on the left is, uh, is an intra-articular arthroscopy showing an articular side of tear. You've got the humeral head um, there just on the right. Um, and the figure on the left is um, from the, the uh, subacromial space looking down showing the bursal side of tear. A there's a classi good classification system of partial thickness tears and it's based on Elman's classification. He essentially defines it based on location and depth. So A, B, C, articular, bursal and interstitial, um, and grade less than three, three to six, and greater than six. And I know we all, we all love our classification systems in orthopaedics, but I think this one's particularly pertinent because it actually does dictate prognosis and it actually does dictate talk about that based on this. I think this is a very good treatment algorithm. This is out of a, a relatively recent um, American Academy Review article and it essentially um, gives you a flow diagram to manage these patients. So all patients should initially have a trial of non-operative management and that should be for 
potentially for a minimum of three months. The vast majority of patients will get symptom improvement with um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, physiotherapy, injections, and activity modification. Um, if they don't improve with uh, non-surgical management, a diagnostic arthroscopy um, is recommended. If they have a bursal sided tear, then less than, if it's less than three millimetres, um, then no further management um, is advocated um, other than debridement and, and uh, chromioplasty. Bursal sided tears of greater than three millimetres, they advocate um, rotator cuff repair with the chromioplasty. Now, articular sided tears um, <coughs> have a little bit more leeway with regards to their management and six millimetre cutoff that they dictate for management of uh, an articular sided tear. Um, and they talk about um, repairing these without a chromioplasty. And most of this is American literature, and I have rarely seen uh, patients have a rotator cuff repair without a chromioplasty in Australia. But we'll talk about some of the literature regarding that. And essentially, it does make some sense because if you think about the natural history of rotator cuff pathology, the, the integrity of the coracoacromial arch is fairly pertinent for end stage disease. So if you can avoid violating that, it makes a lot of sense. So the treatment here we've just talked about, so non-operative improves patients in around 90%. However, most patients, the size, the, the, tear, the size of the tear does progress in most patients. However, their symptoms remain well controlled. And some people advocate doing a repeat ultrasound at six to 12 months just to make sure that they're not getting a significant increase in size despite their lack of <coughs> symptoms. Um, arthroscopy and arthroscopic acromioplasty are probably the mainstay, or they are essentially in the paper in the shoulder surgery that I've seen in my training. However, you want to take meticulous care to preserve the coracoacromial arch and ligament so that you do have a superior restraint if you get um, a, a recurrence of the tear or further rotator cuff incompetence down the track. Um, arthroscopic or mini open rotator cuff repair shows similar results and we'll talk about some of the literature um, in the future. And articular sided tears, most um, authors would advocate completion of the tear and performing a double row um, rotator cuff repair and in bursal sided tears obviously you can just do a double row repair. <clears throat> um, full thickness tears getting towards the more severe end of the spectrum can be classified as acute versus chronic based on the size of the tear, small, medium, large and massive, also based on the number of tendons involved. Presentation in these patients, pain is usually a less prominent feature than it is in partial thickness tears, but weakness is often more severe. A significant proportion of patients, however, can be asymptomatic, if they're, especially if they're low demand and, and in the more elderly. And 28% uh, of patients over the age of 60 will have a full thickness rotator cuff repair if you MRI them and they're asymptomatic. Um, Examination signs that would support a full thickness tear may be as things along the lines of a drop arm sign, which indicates significant tearing and weakness of the supraspinatus, external rotation lag, which is weakness of the infraspinatus, horn blower's sign, which gives an indication to incompetence of the T's muscle, is the drop or belly press test, which is an indication of subscapularis incompetence. Um, the investigations are essentially not significantly different from the ones we've discussed. However, MRI in this population can be justified a little bit more because in a full thickness tear, especially one with, which is of significant size and chronicity, you may want to assess the muscle for degeneration, fatty atrophy, and the condition of the actual muscle belly itself, which is very difficult to do on any other imaging modality, um, and also assessing the degree of retraction that's feasible. Um, <coughs> treatment of full thickness tears, essentially the mainstay of initial management is non-operative. Vocor in 1993 looked at a number of patients who had symptomatic, so these are patients who were symptomatic, full thickness tears, and he followed them for seven years, and these patients had conservative therapy only. 74% of these patients had no or little pain at seven years um, post-diagnosis. However, only 56% of the patients who'd had symptoms for more than six months prior to presentation had good um, results. So it appears that patients who have had a significant um, symptomatic interval prior to presentation will do um, less well with conservative management. 
He noticed that these patients had a marked improvement in function and range of motion and had, quote unquote, a comfortable and useful shoulder. Um, however, he recognised that surgical treatment is the gold standard in most full thickness symptomatic tears in more active patients. So some of the operative indications for full thickness tears. So a symptomatic tear which has failed three months or more of non-operative management. Full thickness tears with significant weakness and functional impairment. Any acute tear in an under 60 degree population, but obviously you take into account their biological age, not <clears throat> purely their chronological age when managing. Um, the, great the great debate, which is uh, one that's always ongoing, is um, open versus arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. I think there's a fair uh, proportion of literature now that would support that there's no difference in outcomes between the two patients with regard to pain and function. Uh, no et al. published a systematic review in JVJS in 2007 they found no, if, no, if, no difference in outcome in pain, shoulder functional scores, et cetera. Um, and I think they looked at these patients at about two to three years. However, there was a trend towards a higher complication rate in mini open surgery. It wasn't quite significant. I think the P was 0.05 rather than less than. However, they had a tendency towards a higher incidence of arthrofibrosis and revision surgery. So that was the open version that did, did worse. Um, Severo et al. in arthroscopy in 2003 again found no difference in functional outcomes. However, he also noted that higher incidence in arthrofibrosis in the open group. I think it can be summarised in a, essentially with the quote at the bottom, do whatever you do best. Um, acromioplasty, as mentioned before, prior to really looking into this literature, I had never considered not doing an acromioplasty in a patient who's having a rotator cuff repair. I've just never seen it done here in Australia. But there is some reasonable um, data to suggest that it could be a more selective um, procedure rather than just blindsiding and acromioplasting everyone. And if you think about the natural history, if they have a recurrence or if they have ongoing rotator cuff incompetence, the coracoacromial arch is their last salvation as a superior straight and preventing anterosuperior escape, um, which basically means all bets are off. Um, McDonald is a very recent uh, multi-centred prospective double-blind double randomised control trial, so a very well conducted level one um, study looking at full thickness rotator cuff tears. They had 68 patients that were randomised to rotator cuff with acromioplasty and rotator cuff without acromioplasty. They essentially found no difference in the initial functional or quality of life outcomes. However, there was a higher reoperation rate in the non acromioplasty group. Four of these patients had reoperation out of the 36 um, cohort, and they were all essentially in type 2 and the majority in type 3 acromions, and they were for revision acromioplasty. Um, so, based on this data, I think it's possible. It makes reasonable sense to be doing a selective acromioplasty based on this acromial morphology and not just getting in there and violating everyone's coracoacromial arch. Um, uh, the last um, stop on the rotator cuff dis dysfunction um, train line is essentially cuff tear arthropathy. As we all know, it's a fairly ordinary end stage um, manifestation of cuff, cuff dysfunction. It's essentially defined as glenohumeral arthrosis with superior humeral head migration due to the loss of the concavity effect of the rotator cuff. Essentially, the rotator cuff normally acts as a forced coupling, so it's got you know, bands at the front and bands on the top, and it pushes the ball into the socket, if you like, and keeps it well centralised. Now, if you get a disruption in this forced coupling, the deltoid is able to pull the humeral head um, in an eccentric manner, and that leads to abnormal loading on the cartilage, which gives you wear and damage and the generation of particulate debris. This particulate debris then stimulates a synovitic reaction, and you can get an enzymatic <coughs> cartilage degeneration. Um, some of the initial um, theories uh, gave rise to, to a, a calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate um, etiology, and it's thought that that's more a reaction to this primary cartilage degeneration than, than a primary inciting event of the arthropathy, arthropathy in its own right. Um, it's essentially seen in females more than males. It's more common in the dominant limb than the non-dominant limb. And they essentially present with swelling, 
pain, weakness, stiffness, and muscle function. So all of the aspects of general arthrosis or arthropathy in addition to the, the manifestations we see of rotator cuff dysfunction. Um, particular to cuff tear arthropathy and uh, findings such as a subcutaneous effusion, a prominent humeral head um, on examination, and they often have gross muscle waste and may have scars indicative of previous surgery that they may have had for their rotator cuff um, previously. They often have a severe limitation in both active and passive range of motion, so-called pseudoparalysis. And they often have uh, palpable or audible crepitus on examination and gross rotator cuff weakness. One of the most important aspects of the examination is to ensure that they've got or, or examined for deltoid function because it's going to um, delineate your potential treatment options down the track. Investigations, again, x-ray is the mainstay um, of investigation. They have generalised osteopenia, essentially. They have superior migration of the humeral head, which is essentially radiographic. There's an acromiohumeral distance of less than seven millimetres. They get femoralisation of the humerus, which is essentially um, changes about the greater tuberosity indicative of um, rotator cuff incompetence and they get acetabularization or sorcerization of the acromion from the uh, humeral head articulating with the undersurface of the acromion. Um, they get joint space narrowing and particularly have a supromedial wear pattern with osteophytes on the superior part of the glenoid which differentiates it from primary glenohumeral arthritis which, uh, in which you get a more an inferior osteophyte pattern. Um, and the end stage of this is anterior escape and femoral head collapse. Um, CT scanning is quite important um, in the workup of these patients because you want to assess uh, bone stock, especially the bone stock of the glenoid and the version of the glenoid if you're going to embark on any um, arthroplasty. Um, Sotsky and Seabow are classified rotator cuff arthropathy, and it's a fairly simple classification system, one is centred and two is uncentred. One essentially implies that you've got some degree of intact force coupling and two implies that your force coupling is disrupted. Um, 1A is stable, you've got minim minimal migration and only really features of coracoacromial acetabularisation. Um, 1B is essentially you've got medialisation with some medial glenoid erosion. Uh, type 2 You've got limited stability in type 2A with some superior translation and supramedial glenoid wear. In type 2B, you've, that implies, sorry, type 2A also implies you've got an intact coracoacromial arch, which is important for your data management. <coughs> type 2B is essentially unstable. You've got antro superior escape, implying a deficient coracoacromial arch and also implying a very difficult management proposition. Again, non-operative management is the initial uh, port of call, so NSAIDs, pain management, physiotherapy, injections, household aids, so things to help people grasp and pick things up, especially with overhead activities, the little sort of uh, trigger um, graspers, etc., and adjusting the home environment so people can function below the shoulder level rather than having to reach up above to get them. Um, Operative management, um, so arthroscopy is the most, is sort of the least invasive, but also gives you the least, um, uh, improve, least improvement in outcomes. Um, essentially, this is limited to, to bridement, lavage, and tuberoplasty because these patients have essentially got an incompetent coracoacromial arch. They don't have much of an acromion to um, acromioplasty. Um, a tuberoplasty is essentially just doing the reverse side of or the reverse of an acromioplasty and just debriding the prominent tuberosity to minimise the amount of impingement. Fenlon uh, looked at a group of patients, I think he had about 20 patients, and he found good improvement in pain scores at 27 months with this relatively conservative approach to surgical management. And then you've obviously got arthroplasty and arthrodesis. Um, um, uh, hemiarthroplasty, essentially the indication for hemiarthroplasty is severe persistent pain and disability refractory to non-operative management. It's indicated in the below 70 year old uh, population, um, but one of the caveats is they must have an intact coracoacromial arch. Obviously they need an intact fu and functional deltoid. If you're not going to be able to lift your arm up, then you have no benefit from placing the joint. Um, Williams and Rockwood looked at 22 patients 
um, in there. It's one of the more one of the earlier series looking at hemiarthroplasty in um, cuff tear arthropathy, and essentially found 18 satisfactory outcomes. On average, they improved the range of motion from 70 degrees of elevation to 120 degrees, and from external rotation of 27 to 46. And I mean, these improvements are essentially taking someone from the non-functional range of motion to the functional range. So there's significant improvements in outcomes for patients who are essentially, by and, all, uh, by and large, low demand. However, it's nice to be able to do things up above your head, brush your hair, etc., get around it and toilet yourself. All of these patients had improvements um, in their pain scores. Um, reverse total shoulder replacement. It's, it's been fairly contentious over the year, the more recent years, and there's lots of literature for and against reverse total shoulders. And I, from what I can take of it is if is if you're doing quite a few of them and you do them well, it's a relatively good salvage operation, but the poor results come um, in people who probably have little experience in them doing what is technically a very demanding operation. The indications are patients over, over 70 years of age, a low demand, um, pseudo-paralysis. They, again, still require a functional deltoid. However, the function may be compromised because one of the aims of um, reverse shoulder replacement surgery is to improve um, the function of the deltoid. And probably the most important thing is adequate, adequate glenoid bone stock. Essentially, the basic principles of a reverse total shoulder are there's a large glenosphere, which gives you a stable construct. The centre of rotation is medialised and distalised, and the offset and, and length of the humerus and therefore the deltoid are increased. This aims to improve the deltoid function because you're increasing the moment arm and also stretching the muscle fibres. Um, and the reason, it also converts the usual shear forces that you would get at the glenoid prosthesis um, bone interface with a conventional total shoulder, um, which causes the rocking forcing and the loosening effect. It converts these forces um, to a compressive force so you get less um, of a problem with glenoid component loosening. Um, so this, I thought, was quite a good diagram, which basically outlines um, here what we're talking about. So here's the increase in offset, you see. The centre of rotation is medialised significantly, and this moment arm of the deltoid is lengthened, so you get all of the effects that we've just previously discussed. <clears throat> However, it's not uh, the be-all and end-all. It's got a significant, um, it's a significant incidence of complications. Um, essentially, the general figure bandied around is that 18% of these fail. Um, they fail because 4% of the glenoids become loose, and this is usually evident in the first two years. There's a huge incidence of scapular notching, but this is generally within the first six, six months. It generally stabilises beyond six months. And beyond six months is generally not a problem. Um, instability is seen in three to four percent of patients, and you also see an incidence of acromial stress fractures from this increased deltoid tension. If you're pulling on the deltoid, you're lengthening the deltoid, and the deltoid's doing all this work to keep your, to, to maintain the function of your shoulder, to do all the abduction of your shoulder, and to keep your shoulder enlocated, um, it can actually cause um, stress failure through the acromion and uh, just, just distal, sorry, just proximal to the deltoid insertion. Um, I've probably gone well over time as it is already. <laughs>